Mars, and how can we counter it? Uh, well, part of the question is how long does it take to get to Mars? And that, that is a question of engines. Uh, you know, if you, if you could use an ion propulsion engine, you could get to Mars in a month or a bit, maybe 36 days. If you could thrust all the way there, or halfway there, and then slow down halfway there. So a 36 day trip would, would be pretty easy to manage from long term effects of weightlessness. But I think the key to the question is, if we did what the, uh, the Mars One project people are thinking and use the engines that exist today, a trip to Mars is on the order of six months, or maybe seven months. And what are the long-term effects of that weightlessness, of course, and other? So let me just talk about this body, because it's been in space for almost the length of time it takes to go to Mars. That's part of the reason we chose six months to live on the International Space Station, is we wanted to see what state we would arrive at on Mars. Uh, your body undergoes a lot of adaptation when you take away gravity. Some of it we understand, some of it you don't. If you don't do anything, it is the most sedentary existence you could imagine. You literally do not have to lift a finger. You don't have to lift your eyelids. You don't have to lift your tongue. You are completely sedentary in space. So your body would waste away if, if you just let it. Your body would not be exercised. Uh, you know, and it would be extremely difficult to then, if you arrived on Mars and wanted to be able to put on a spacesuit, it would be very difficult to drive the spacesuit around because of what would have happened to your body. The, uh, the effects are as follows. Uh, you would get muscle wasting if you didn't do exercise. And so on the space station, we have exercise equipment. That, uh, that strains the muscles. Uh, we have a, a, sort of a big uh, bow flex kind of thing that we push against called the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device. And we have a bicycle and a treadmill. The treadmill, you're held down by big elastics so that you can run on this treadmill. The treadmill is balanced on a big gyroscope so that as you pound the floor with your feet, it doesn't shake the whole station and wreck all the experiments. So it's sort of like running on a treadmill that's in a canoe. It's kind of weird to run on, to balance on. But in my five months on space station, I actually came back stronger than I launched, with more muscle than I launched. I increased my muscle mass because of the equipment we put on station. So that problem is solved. Our astronauts will show up at Mars stronger than they left Earth. Also, there's no chips, no fried food, no beer. So I actually lost a little fat. I kept exactly the same weight, more lean muscle mass, and I lost a little bit of fat. So I came back ripped. So, <laughs> so the guys who show up on Mars are going to look really good, in case there are Martians there evaluating. Uh, so the, uh, the muscle problem is largely solved. Uh, your balance system is useless to you in space, at least the one that we need for gravity. The, the, all those little sensors in the inner ear that allow you to balance with your eyes closed, that constantly evaluate the acceleration vector of the Earth's gravity in order to tell you which way is up. It's not excited, it's not used for the whole time, pretty much, that you're on your way to Mars. You're coasting, you're weightless for half a year. So that system shuts down. And then when you first get to Mars, your body, because even though it only has 38% of Earth's gravity, it's going to be exciting again. When you first land on Mars, you are going to be dizzy and disoriented and nauseous, just like getting off a ride at the fair. You're going to be all dizzy and, and discombobulated, and we can expect those astronauts to take four or five days before they would ever want to get in a spacesuit and go outside on a spacewalk, just because of those, those negative effects in your balance system. Um, cardiovascular system. Even though I exercise two hours every day and use the treadmill and use the, uh, the bicycle, my heart shrunk and my arteries got hardened. I got arterial sclerosis and my body completely forgot how important it was to lift the blood all the way from my feet up to my head so I could stand up. That there's, there's an amazing collection of mechanisms that, that basically lifts the fluid all the way from the ground level all the way up to your brain and eyes, so that you can see and think. It's complicated. It's all the little subtle things that happen, the flexibility of the veins and arteries, the muscular things, the strength of the heart. It's a complex system, all pressure regulated, 
You haven't used that in five months. So when the people get to Mars, they'll have to wear G-suits that squeeze their calves and their thighs and their abdomen. Just, it's like squeezing the bottom of a balloon to keep the fluid at the top. And we'll have to wear those for a few days, and it'll be a gradual adaptation for several days until their body remembers how to lift the bloods up to their head. The one problem that, well, two problems. Uh, the one that we really have to solve internally is osteoporosis. When you don't load up your skeleton, your body starts to dissolve it. And we don't really understand the mechanism within the human body. But the first time you use the toilet in space, your urine is full of your skeleton. Within an hour of getting to space, whatever sensors there are in the body, they realize you don't need this big skeletal structure to fight gravity. You're, you're, I mean, you could be a jellyfish and you'll be fine when you're in space. So it stops building your skeleton. In fact, it starts shedding your skeleton. And it's only through the two hours of resistive exercise every day that we keep our skeleton density. And, and we've solved it everywhere. All through my body, my bone density stayed the same, except across my hips and the top end of my femur, because we just couldn't get the loads on there that we get through running and lifting and turning and twisting under gravity. So we need, we used to have exercise device, then we had the resistive exercise device, and then the IRED, whatever that was, ISS resistive exercise. Now we have the advanced resistive exercise device, and we're to the point where we've solved everywhere but the hips. So maybe next one with the super duper resistive exercise device, we will have figured out, because when you lift weights, you always do it so beautifully symmetrically. You don't get all the transverse loads that your bones need, so your body demands dense bones. But I think we can solve that one. I think with a few more iterations on the space station, we'll learn how to keep bone density up. Then the last two problems will probably be primarily the high radiation, because as soon as you get out of the magnetic field of the Earth, you get the radiation from our sun and all the suns of the universe with no shielding. We already get pretty high radiation on the space station. It becomes one of our limiters for how long we can spend in space, and it's inside the magnetic field. So we're going to have to figure out how to protect the ship and the crew and the surface of Mars from radiation. And then the last one is psychological. How do you keep the crew from going crazy? Because on the space station, anytime you feel a little bit crazy or lonely, you can phone someone. We have like Skype. Or you can look out the window and look at the beauty of the world. On the way to Mars, within a week, you won't be able to see the world as anything more than a speck. And within a month or so, you won't be able to have a real-time conversation ever again with Earth. The delay will be so long that it'll be like, hello? <laughs> hello? It, it'll be like using a cell phone. <laughs> uh, no, but you won't be able to have a real-time conversation. So that crew, within weeks, will have become Martians, psychologically. They will no longer be of Earth. So how do we keep a crew psychologically healthy when in their minds they have become a separate entity from planet Earth? And that may be a really tough one to crack, too. We're studying that, like through the Mars 500 project the Russians did, and we're looking at using the space station, isolating crews for a month at a time with delayed communication. We do it at the bottom of the ocean, where we go live at the bottom of the ocean with delayed communications and a little bit of sensory deprivation. And, uh, we, but I think in truth what we're going to have to have is, is like the holodeck, you know, on Star Trek, where you have virtual reality for the crew so that they can get on their Alex exercise bicycle and go for a ride through Hyde Park, Hyde Park and make random turns and hear the birds chirp and smell and the sounds and just as if they were doing something healthy on Earth that was mentally stimulating. I think we need to get virtual reality to the level that, that that becomes available to them in order to keep them mentally healthy and stable to go there. But all of those problems are solvable. But I think the real one that, that we'd like to solve is the engines. Because if we can get there in 30 days, then all of those problems except radiation take care of themselves and, uh, and uh, it makes it much more accessible. And let me just say what an honor it is to be in the same room with uh, Professor Hawking, an incredibly accomplished and respected mind who has been a tremendous example to everybody else.